Good morning, Dr. Chaudhuri. Let us start. Uh, good, good morning, morning sir. sir. Okay, so let's start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening at the different part of the world, wherever you are in the world, because this is webinar going everywhere throughout the world with the speakers at different places. So I will welcome to all the participants of the international webinar on resilient agriculture in saline environments under changing climates, jointly organized by ICR and ICBA. And I am R. K. Singh, the moderator of this event, working as program leader of crop diversification and genetics section at International Center for Biosaline Agriculture. I would like to inform all the participants that their microphones are muted and the audio is off to avoid eco and save the bandwidth capacity to ensure a smooth presentation session. And if there is any comment, please use chat function. So these are the simple housekeeping rules. The webinar is being recorded also, and the link would be circulated after the webinar. You can, it is also live on the Facebook. And the for question and answer, please use Q&A, question and answer function button on your screen, and all the solutions and questions will be compiled for the Q&A sessions. The pertinent questions will be taken care of within the session. If we cannot do that, we can send by email also, if you can write the email address. So today we have two distinguished patrons, the Director General of ICR and Director General of ICBA, and six panelists from the various pioneer institution on salinity in the world. Let's listen to the expert panelists, but request all the panelists to stick to the allocated time, please. And on the basis of that, what, why we are doing this webinar, to start with, first I will invite Dr. P.C. Sharma, Director C. Sare Karnal, for his brief remarks on, about the seminar, about the webinar. Dr. Sharma, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. R.K. Good morning, all friends, for this seminar. Uh, around 1,000 million hectares salt affected soils there in the globe, comprising saline, saline sodic, and sodic soils. And in the climate change era, we have more challenges with respect to management of the salt affected soils. And the problem is increasing day by day. The world as a whole is losing around three hectares of arable land every minute due to soil salinization. Dry land salinity, coastal salinity and seawater ingress are the other challenging issues. Specific approaches are needed to reclaim and manage these soils to maintain long-term productivity. Keeping all these in view, this today's joint international salinity webinar that is being organized by ICR, CSRI and ICBA. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. So thank you for the brief introduction about the webinar. So first I will invite Dr. Mahapatra for inaugural, inaugural address. So Dr. Trilokan Mahapatra, who is secretary to the government of India, Department of Agriculture Research and Education, also called DAIR, and Director General of Indian Council of Agriculture Research. People say outside of the India, it's ICAR. In India, it's ICR, but in the outside India, they sort of talk about the ICAR. He needs hardly an introduction. He's an eminent scientist. He's a renowned molecular geneticist and has a lot of work on genomics. I don't want to go in the detail. He bestowed with a number of awards. If I will start counting on that, you know, it will take so much time to just count all those awards. And also the fellowships. Before he was, before joining this as a DG of ICR, he served as a director of very premier institution in India, that's IERI, Indian Agriculture Research Institute, also called USA Institute. And before that, he was also director of National Rice Research Institute at Qatar. So with, without any, uh, uh, wasting the time, I will invite Dr. Mahapatra, he's a very busy person. So I will invite Dr. Mahapatra for the inaugural letters. Dr. Mahapatra, please. Thank you very much. Very good morning to everybody who are linked today to this uh, particular program on uh, in, uh, international uh, salinity webinar. Uh, the uh, theme uh, which is chosen is a resilient agriculture in saline environments under changing climate. A very appropriate one. So I take this opportunity uh, to have my own word of uh, welcome. Uh, 
uh, to everyone present here, and particularly DG Ikba, my own colleagues, Dr. S.K. Chaudhuri, Deputy Director General, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Dr. R.K. Singh from Ikba, Dr. P.C. Sarma, Director, uh, Soil Salinity Research Institute, and there are many others. I see a number of experts who have joined today in this particular program uh, from various uh, 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 institutions, organizations across the globe, uh, and also my own colleagues from the Council, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and other institutions from India. So delegates and friends, I find there are 297 participants at this point in time. So excellent uh, program uh, on a very pertinent issue, a global issue uh, who are, uh, which, which are being addressed uh, you know, uh, in this particular uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. R.K. Singh has been in constant uh, touch with me, Dr. R.K. Singh of Iqbal. So there are several R.K. Singhs in India. <laughs> Often it is confusing. So Dr. R.K. Singh of Iqba has been in constant touch. And uh, in fact, Dr. R.K. Singh worked at the Soil Salinity Research Institute India. Our own institute uh, spent more than 20 years of his service there as a scientist, senior scientist, and uh, senior positions he occupied. And uh, moved on to International Rice Research Institute, and then subsequently uh, to ICBA. So I think he has an excellent track record of mobility, uh, you know, and climbing high uh, in his career. So Dr. R.K. Singh and myself, we have been interacting on uh, uh, you know salinity and salinity-related issues, uh, you know, for a pretty long time because that has been his core area of activity for decades. So, uh, and then uh, uh, when we say salinity, uh, and uh, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just Indian phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And uh, we know that about 20% of the global, uh, you know, uh, agricultural land, uh, you know, uh, is uh, impacted uh, with, uh, you know, this uh, problem. And, uh, uh, and not only India, but across countries. I'm told uh, more than 120 countries are uh, impacted uh, by uh, this particular problem. And uh, uh, given this uh, huge uh, uh, area which is impacted, and given the number of countries uh, which are uh, you know, uh, uh, also uh, facing this particular problem, uh, so, uh, so this is a very issue uh, of concern. So very much issue of concern. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, you know, um, uh, the objective probably uh, before this deliberation happened. Uh, you know, this could have been the driving uh, idea uh, that, uh, you know, we should be deliberating uh, to uh, take advantage of experience, expertise, knowledge systems available anywhere in the world uh, so that we build uh, programs in different countries to address this problem. Certainly, uh, this problem uh, is uh, at places is of our own creation. Uh, the uh, irrigated ecologies where the underground water is uh, pumped uh, indiscriminately uh, and uh, I, uh, this uh, unmindfully, uh, we uh, start uh, creating salinity problem uh, in irrigated ecosystem. And uh, uh, certainly, I know I'm told about more than 30%, uh, 30 to 33% uh, of the irrigated agricultural land, uh, you know, uh, having this uh, kind of issues uh, to a certain extent, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is a problem. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then the, when we say that irrigated ecologies, which are supposed to be in India, for instance, our bread basket, uh, you know, uh, in the Northwest Plain zone, which is considered our bread basket, you know, uh, there, uh, this problem uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is there. Uh, and also elsewhere else, uh, this problem existing in India. 
uh, uh, and productivity loss uh, due to this uh, to the tune of 8% is a very, very significant one. And we, sh we and that's the reason why uh, this has to be taken not only by scientists, but all stakeholders, including the policymakers seriously, that, uh, you know, how do we really address this problem in irrigated ecologies to start with, and where the salinization is increasing, and uh, uh, the problem is a really challenging one. And uh, how do we really uh, ad address uh, the loss of productivity uh, due to this problem uh, in uh, various uh, countries, including India, and particularly in the uh, bread basket, in the grain bowels, uh, in the areas where uh, the most uh, production productivity gains we have seen in the past. Uh, these uh, kind of uh, practices which are uh, which are being uh, you know implemented uh, uh, across the globe uh, you know of, uh, all the agricultural practices which are implemented across the globe uh, you know uh, we have to really revisit those practices and then see that uh, you know how by altering in our own way the practices we can address those problems and i'm sure when you deliberate on various issues uh, uh, concerning uh, you know, uh, this uh, problem, so you would be certainly deliberating on way ahead, uh, how we, the scientists, can provide alternative means uh, you know, of addressing this, uh, particularly changing the cultural practices uh, in the process uh, in intensive agricultural uh, situations. Uh, so when I say that this is what uh, you know is the problem, and uh, when uh, the climate change is uh, happening and we are not able to really address adequately, and uh, this is accentuating the problems which is there with regard to uh, many uh, uh, confronted by agriculture sector, and salinity is one such problem, a challenge, uh, uh, you know, which is there because of uh, climate change. As uh, the temperature rise, as the seawater rise, and uh, coastal inundation increases, uh, and uh, you know it is said that seawater might rise uh, by more than one meter by 2050, and certainly once that happens, and this would provide another alternate, uh, another uh, you know uh, challenge in addition to the inland salinity which is arising because of use of large scale indiscriminate use of underground water, so. So this, because we have uh, very little control, of course, COVID has uh, put some control over greenhouse gas emissions, and that's a positive which has come out of the COVID impact. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, we are not really able to really address the greenhouse gas emissions, the uh, temperature rise, our targets, uh, you know, uh, we are, I doubt whether we'll be able to uh, meet those. Uh, so once that happens and billions of people are going to be impacted, particularly those in the coastal regions, and uh, uh, so this uh, uh, might be another area of concern that we need to really address them. And uh, uh, the uh, International Center for Biosaline Agriculture and the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, you know, I believe that these institutions uh, have uh, uh, tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunities uh, as well as responsibility uh, to uh, deal with this particular problem. Uh, we have been dealing with this in our own ways. Dr. Arkesing knows the details about it. And uh, Iqbal is also addressing this at international level. And there could be a global forum of, on salinity. Uh, you know, if it is there, it needs to be really uh, made mandatory for countries impacted by them to be part of it so that we uh, take the deliberation, uh, build action plans, uh, you know, to the next height and then start implementing in our respective countries. I think that would be, that should be one of the, you know, uh, objective of this particular uh, winner, that how do we really build a global partnership on this and develop programs and implement in all the member countries so who would be participating in this and so that uh, the problems are addressed. We say gypsum application would address the soil salinity, but gypsum itself is limiting. Uh, the uh, naturally available gyps gypsum is scarce. And given this scarce commodity to be used uh, uh, in the fields, uh, you know, which is rapidly increasing in area, and it would be a serious concern. And what should be the alternatives? 
and uh, obviously there has to be a alternative and similarly you know our institute has developed sub surface drainage system and this sub surface particularly in case of rice and uh, you know but then uh, the non availability of the appropriate machinery system for sub surface drainage and how do we really expand this globally and then use this as a technology as a solution for sub surface drainage because drainage is important aspect of flushing out uh, the salts from the surface layers top surface layers where soil is surrendered for tile and remains for tile so that productivity is uh, maintained and uh, you know uh, also at the same time we know dr rk singh has been working to develop genotypes which can be uh, you know uh, tolerating high levels of uh, salinity soil salinity alkalinity and sodicity so so different aspects of it so when we were working on this and identifying sources of resistance i strongly believe that uh, there are genotypes which are identified uh, germ plasm is there as uh, in rice we have about 1.5 uh, you know rather uh, 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 almost uh, you know uh, how much 150 uh, uh, 15 uh, 1.5 lakhs how much it is uh, you know uh, 0.15 million uh, for the understanding of everybody 0.15 million uh, you know uh, germ plasm there in the germ gene bank and many of them are collected from saline environments and uh, various mechanisms whether someone is excluding uh, salt or someone is accumulating salt and various mechanisms are existing which we understand and uh, at the global level also the pathways are under, uh, you know uh, being examined and then uh, already uh, worked out uh, that sos for instance uh, pathway and the many other genes which are involved in this pathways they are known glyxylase 1 and glyxylase 2 which are cloned in this country characterized and deployed to understand how the mechanism glyxylase pathway mechanism operates in salt tolerance in rice for instance and they have been deployed in transgenic to understand what is the extent of uh, salinity imparted by these genes there are number of other examples globally where uh, you know uh, the soil salinity Uh, is uh, being tried to be addressed through gm roof so while uh, you know natural genetic variation using biodiversity which is existing available with us uh, globally uh, we are free to use those and then develop newer varieties uh, in uh, rice itself with the along with the quality we have been able to develop csr30 for instance which has basmati quality along with the soil salinity uh, tolerance and similarly csr36 for instance which is also very good in sodic soil situation that's what has been seen in this country so globally such efforts are being made and this need to be intensified can the, when we talk of this global networking and uh, uh, global action plan this could be a, a kind of uh, opportunity for us to go for exchange of germ plasm varieties and then build such programs in countries where it is not there and they learn from experience of each other so that such uh, you know uh, challenges are met squarely uh, you know in recent times we our institutes have identified microbial microbial uh, resources the organisms and consortia which can be utilized to address this problem so uh, i believe that's another route of uh, you know utilizing this issue and uh, while you know there could be multiple ways to address these uh, problems and i'm sure the uh, webinar is going to deliberate on these issues elaborately and uh, to and also will come out with recommendations uh, for all of us to really work on and uh, some of those things which i highlighted this is uh, not that i am expert in this area based on the input provided by my colleagues i am talking about this i had also a program called uh, bioprospecting of genes in allele mining where salinity was also a very important component not only the rice but also microbes were identified uh, from ocean uh, you know and their mechanisms are being worked out so there are many things uh, to really uh, you know deliberate and there are experts to provide uh, guidance and i'm sure you will take all of you will take maximum uh, advantage of this particular webinar and now there are more than 330 people that are associated with this particular program i'm sure once the experts start deliberating there will be many more people joining to take full advantage of this webinar i uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, all the organizers uh, particularly dr rk singh from ikba 
my own colleagues from ICR, Dr. P.C. Sarma, Dr. Choudhury, and others, uh, you know, who have uh, taken uh, you know uh, their time out to really organize this. I thank everybody who are uh, associated with this program today, and wish this program all the very best. Uh, there are many things to talk about, and uh, I can't be the sole speaker. So obviously, there are others to speak about and give their viewpoints on various facets of salinity and salinity tolerance and how to address the management issues, climate change issues, and all that in entirety. So we, I hope uh, that we will be getting excellent recommendation out of it. So thank you very much. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mapatra. And uh, thank you giving the insight about the salinity problems and also the word of wisdom. Definitely we will come up with the recommendation and definitely we have already worked together when we were together in the research area more rather than administration. We have a long association with them. So just to go ahead with that, I will introduce you the next at our next patron, Dr. Isman Ilupi, the another distinguished scientist and renowned person in the field of agriculture. So I will just give a brief remark, or, be, or rather brief introduction about Dr. Ilofi. Dr. Isman Ilofi is the Director General of International Center of Biosaline Agriculture based in Dubai and United Arab Emirates. She is internationally known as a strong advocate of alternate, alternative approaches to food and nutritional security in marginal environments including use of neglected and underutilized crop and non-fresh water resources in agriculture. She is very, very big proponent about the crop diversification. She has around two decades of experience in agriculture research and development in Asia, Africa, and Middle East. She is a recipient of several prestigious awards, a number of them, just few of them are like accolades, including the national reward medal by His Majesty Mohammed VI, the King of Morocco 2014, and the Excellence of Science Award from the Global Thinkers Forum. You know, recently she is one of the, our CJR system board member. And also rec very recently, she has been appointed as a very unique thing. That's the first ever chief scientist of FAO. So the floor is Dr. Isman, our DG, to you for your inaugural address, please. Dr. Isman. Hello. Thank you very much, RK. And thank you very much to Dr. Mahapatra for the great Putting things in context. I'm really happy to see this uh, virtual conference taking place in collaboration between ICAR or ACAR and ICMA. Uh, it's really good. I see lots of synergies. I remember fondly our visit to India about a year and a half ago or two years almost now, a year and a half ago, and really visiting the centers and seeing a whole region that used to be saline, but it is productive. And really, that's what we believe in, is that with science and innovation, we're gonna find solution and hopefully overcome the issues and find solution that will allow farmers to survive under salinity issues and under marginality per se. So uh, if you allow me, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's really nice to be with you today. And to give you the opening remark, I see that we are now more than 330 people. And I hope really that more gonna join. It's really nice to see that virtually we could connect even maybe sometimes a bigger number that we used to do in a, in a conference per se. So today our world is undergoing major transformation. And it is because of COVID-19 pandemic. For better or worse, nearly every sector is adapting to new circumstances and ways of doing things. So profound is the pandemic impact that business as usual is no longer an option. And we see it in education, we see it in health, we see it in all sectors, in our life day to day. And they think agriculture and food production are no exceptions. They have as well to adapt to these new circumstances. The crisis put our food system to the test. And unfortunately, we cannot say that we did very well, nor did our food system. Some analysis warned that nearly another 100 million people might become food insecure. And this is due to the pandemic effect over the last only, we have been in it for almost now eight months. 
And this 100 million going to join the 821 million that we had already as we have the data from 2019. So the numbers are increasing instead of decreasing. So what we knew about the shortcoming in our food system before the pandemic became clear during the pandemic. And if we consider climate change as one of the factors, as mentioned by Dr. Mahapatra, we know for a fact that they are not fit for the future. So our food system is definitely not fit for the future. But climate change is not the only challenge we have. We have major other challenges. Agriculture and food production are also seriously constrained by soil and water salinity. And I'm very happy that really Dr. Mahapatra went in details and talk about it as a scientist, as a policymaker, as a person that managed it for over many years. This is particularly true for marginal environments where soil and water salinity is among the biggest risks to food security. So there is an estimate that says 1.1 billion hectares of soil are affected globally by salinity and sodicity to variate degrees. Salinization caused major economic losses in many countries where agriculture makes up a big share of their GDP. As climate change accelerated, accelerated, accelerates and new arable lands and freshwater resources became scarcer, we will need to find new ways to produce our food. This is why it is very crucially important to tap into the potential of agrobiodiversity saline agriculture, and what we call alternative waters. There are many plant species that thrive in saline and arid environment. They are not staple crops, that's for sure, but they are a part of the diet of many people and could take a bigger portion of the diet of people at large. Some of them, like halophytes, are suitable for human and animal consumption. I want to give the example of saliconia, which can grow up to sea water salinity level. At ICBA, we have been studying ways to grow saliconia using reject brine and seawater in an integrated agriculture aquaculture system. And this system also make it possible to farm fish and vegetables, increasing the returns on investment. So what we are trying to do, it's really develop a model whereby we are using the reject brine or the seawater for fish and then for saliconia and the fresh water for vegetables. So the farmer has many income, different, different sources of incomes. We recently started developing value chain for halophyte based food products with our partners in the United Arab Emirates, particularly Expo 2020, but also Abu Dhabi Environment Agency, uh, Khalifa Fund. So we also tap into the funding agencies to provide credit and facilitation for farmers and also private sector to really get more innovative in terms of food product out of halophytes. We also we are also introducing saliconia in other countries where salinity is a big issue. For example, in Egypt, example Morocco and, and others and Central Asia as well. Our results to date show that it's possible to enhance productivity and utility of lands and water resources degraded by salinity. We believe that saline soil and water resources should be viewed as assets rather than liabilities in our effort to improve food and nutrition security and to reduce poverty in marginal environments. Every type of land and water suitable for food production should be used to meet current and future food demand. We have not invested enough in marginal environments. So if we don't have solution today, the problem is us. We never gave it the, the importance it requires. We never fight for it. We never give it enough time and resources to find solution. But if we want to really feed everybody, if we want to pull out of poverty those, those people living in marginal environment, we have to provide them solution within their ecosystem. And with only one decade left to meet the target of the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, we must draw the right lessons from the pandemic, and we need to double down our efforts to transform our food system and make them more resilient and sustainable. 
we need to change our food system, make them better for people and better for the planet. And I'm really excited to see the list of the six speakers that are following me. It's really very nice to see scientists coming together to talk about issues that matters. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, uh, Dr. Arke. Many thanks, Dr. Isman. Many thanks. I know that uh, under your leadership, the salinity amelioration efforts has gone to new heights, whether it's a Central Asia, whether it's a uh, MENA region, whether it's a different Sub-Saharan Africa country. And definitely with your efforts and Dr. Mahapatra efforts, we can have a global partnership on that and then we can just work more like a, in the, with the synergies of that. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much to do you and Dr. Mahapatra, both our very like a learned pattern, patterns and then guiding forces. And with this, I will start, I will ask, uh, like uh, start the speaker section. And in this one, the first, our eminent speaker is Dr. Ronald Vargas. He's Secretary of Global Soil Partnership, Land and Water Officer in FAO. And just you will be, you know, happy to know that, you know, he just concluded one of the session, inaugural session in Korea, and then he joined us now. So he is a very busy person and we got him. Uh, for this uh, very important, important, uh, you know, organize, organize this webinar. So his title would be Global Status of Salt Affected Soils. And just I will introduce him for, uh, you know, in the brief. He has a long introduction, but I will just give the brief things on that. So Ronald is a soil scientist with over 15 years of working experience in the natural resource management. His work focus on sustainable soil management for food security and ecosystem services. He joined FU in 2011 as a land and water officer and is the secretary of the Global Soil Partnership, which is the biggest you know, organization working on the soils since its establishment in 2012. He leads the technical and scientific cooperation within, the, within and among regions, coordinates the facility, coordinates and facilitates the establishment of joint actions between governments, research institutions, and NGOs for the achievement of soil related SDGs. He promoted the International Year of Soils, revised World Soil Charter, the Status of the World Soil Resources Report, the Voluntary Guidelines for the Sustainable Soil Management, and the International Code of Conduct for the Sustainable Use and Management of Fertilizers. So floor is yours, Dr. Ronald. You can, uh, you can share the screen and we can start the presentation. And the floor is yours, Dr. Ronald. Dr. Ronald, please. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, all colleagues. and. Uh, all protocol of Sarah, of course. Dr. Singh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to, to share here something that is, of course, of our interest. Uh, already, Ms. Uh, Dr. Elofi mentioned why this uh, issue of soil salinity is important, especially for us that work in food security. So I will try now to share about the global status of soil salinity, trying to focus on the work that we are trying to do in that regard. So, the global status of soil affected soils. First, it's very important always to remind that a healthy soil is capable of providing multiple, if not most of the terrestrial ecosystem services, thus contributing to different agendas globally, but especially locally, from food production, but also to nutrient cycling, to carbon sequestration, and of course, other non-productive uh, uh, ap applications like for instance, uh, being used of uh, the, the place where cities are grown. Anyway, the important thing here is to highlight that soils can help us a lot to deal with all of the issues that we are facing currently. Soil affected soils, now they become very important. It is very, and this is clearly noting that there were efforts from many institutions, primarily ICBA promoting this issue. And we are very glad that currently this is something on the global agenda. 
By definition, soil affect, salt affected soils are soils with high amounts of soluble salts or sodium ions. Okay, and what we are trying to do now is to include it in terms of need for action. Why? Because this has been identified as one of the 10 major global soil threats that we are facing. And significantly, this, this issue has impacts not only on agriculture, food production, but on the environment and water. So it is very important to address it because it can have negatively uh, influence and impact, especially on soil productivity and quality, especially in regions like Near East, Central Asia, but many others where irrigation is taking place, not in a way that should be done. Thus, we have to relate those two main areas. And of course, if we are able to manage salt affected soils, in a very good way, it can mean that we can have significant economic potential for all of us. What are the main drivers of salt, uh, of salt problems? Well, basically we need to differentiate the primary salinity due to natural causes, natural environments that of course have this, not, a, not this as a problem because we need to differentiate here Sometimes we call it degradation, but there are natural environments who have salinity, and this doesn't mean that these are degraded, but that they are typically saline soils. Then we have the secondary salinity, which is where we are really very concerned because of the unsustainable land use and, and agricultural practices that are taking place and causing this. Among the primary drivers, of course, in terms of uh, natural salinity is salty parent materials, climate related to arid and semi-arid uh, places where evapotranspiration is higher than precipitation, groundwater, uh, quite a lot in terms of sea and tidal water, um, but also we have issues related to flood or runoff from salt affected areas to others. While in the sec secondary drivers, we are addressing more the issue of human induced salinity, caused many, in many cases by irrigation, um, and sustainable irrigation, of course, inappropriate fertilizer application, improper disposal of waste, inappropriate use of waste water. You know, sometimes we are trying to best make best use of these resources, but sometimes we are not careful enough. Misuse of soil amendments and inappropriate soil water management and land use changes. What are some common standards or indicators that we use in order to address, assess salt affected soils? First, we conventionally divide these salt affected soils into saline, saline sodic or sodic. And then we have some salt properties used as proxy indicators of salinity or sodicity or the, the way in between. And those are electrical conductivity, exchangeable sodium percentage, percentage pH, sodium absorption ratio, among, let's say, the most commonly used indicators. And of course, we have this classification. And for us, this is very important because then we can use it to assess these three main types of salt affected soils. What is the global distribution of salt affected soils? Well, there have been many efforts by scientists, by institutions in order to address how many hectares globally are affected by this phenomenon. Here you can see a summary of the main let's say, studies per region and in time. So, well, the latest information is that we have 1.1 billion hectares affected by salinity. But what we are trying to see is to have an effort in order to really have, let's say, not the exact number, 
because, well, that will be always approximate, but to have an approach in which we can be able to, uh, to have countries uh, understanding the salinity issue by themselves. Many attempts on mapping the salt affected soils have been done. You can see from starting from the 70s, but we have some recent ones. And what we, we identify that there is a gap because sometimes when trying to have global assessments, we cannot have access to national data sets, national data, which is very important because otherwise we are having a global picture, but without uh, local data. And that's really an issue. Uh, furthermore, whenever we are trying to address uh, an issue of assessing, harmonization is fundamental because every country and every region have their own methodologies for measuring soils, but also for uh, the measuring soils in the labs, but also for how we take the samples, how we, which units we use. And sometimes when there is absence of national soil information systems, we don't have that harmonization process to bring data together in the same units, in the same measurements, etc. That is why we in, uh, in FAO, at the Global Soil Partnership, we are having initiatives to map different soil threats following a country-driven approach. What does it mean? It means that we want countries to develop and prepare their own soil information because they are the, the ones who also need to monitor that. We cannot do that in a top-down approach. This needs to be done by them. And that's why this country-driven process is focused on enhancing capacity development of national experts. And all this is drawn to a network that we have that is called International Network of Soil Information Institutions. So basically, the first thing we do in this network is to develop technical specifications and guidelines. So all technical experts come together and discuss what are the technical specifications to produce the global salt affected soils, but following a country driven approach where harmonization and capacity develop, development are cross cutting. And what we tend to ask is to use the best available data and information by each country. And we don't ask for the raw data. What we ask for is the final products according to the technical specifications. So basically that's how we, we, we proceed. And we use a harmonized methodology defining these specifications that you can see. And there we clearly agree that we need to have three indicator maps at one kilometer resolution depicting electric, electric conductivity from saturated base extract, the pH, and exchangeable sodium percent, percent. Then we do a sort of classification regarding the severity of salinity or sodicity, and we always need to also produce the uncertainty estimation because we need to know how reliable this map is. That's very important for decision making. And then we move into the capacity development phase where we have material for training on how to produce this map, starting from the software introduction, but fundamentally the data preparation, which is the key part here, and then the harmonization, the modeling, the evaluation of the performance of these models, the classification, and then the estimation of uncertainty. So all countries receive this training because we have organized, although there has been this COVID, but with the virtual tools, it was more challenging, but we were able to organize eight regional trainings for all regions so that we can have more 117 national experts from 117 countries trained on this methodology so that then they can produce their own maps. So we started to receive those maps per country. Like here you have an example in, this is from Nicaragua for instance, but here you can see on the left side, the 
uh, electric conductivity map, and then on the right side, the uncertainty of that map, meaning how reliable this map is. In here, for instance, we got the one from India specifically, where you can see already the classification in terms of saline or sodic, etc. And you also have uncertainty regarding the classification of this map. The, currently, we have received around 40 countries who delivered their map, and we are expecting to. Uh, to produce and bring together all these maps by April next year. So we are in this process. You will understand that uh, having countries produce their own map and their specific standards is not an easy task. So 40 countries is quite a lot for the time being because it's not that salinity is an issue in many other countries. So many countries will have blank uh, in the global map because they don't have this issue. Uh, associated with the map, we will have a global status report of soil affected soils. Again, every country is producing this report, but then we will bring together all this information into regional and global perspectives so that then we will be able to tell you currently what are the extent and what are the drivers of soil affected soils. Once we have all this information, we want no, we will not stop there because we believe that it is fundamental to, to move into how to manage salt affected soils, how to address this issue, how to prevent it, etc. So for that, we have together with ICPA, we have launched the International Network of, of Soil Affected Soils, I think a year ago. And maybe you will see that we were not active in terms of the network per se, because what we are trying to do is to finalize this map first, so that then we know where this problem is, what, what is the extent, what is the severity, and with this information, try to address how we can bring management, monitoring, and of course, if needed be, how we can make things happen on the ground. So this is the network that will be there for assisting with this issue. And I hope all of you can join this network in order to together address this issue because we can transform it into a big opportunity because there is big opportunity and this has been demonstrated scientifically and with many projects already around the world, but different scientists. And indeed, we are planning the, 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 the second meeting of this network towards the end of this year. So we will invite you all to be part of it. And next year in September, well, I don't know yet the format because you will understand the situation, but we will organize the Global Symposium on Salt Affected Soils in Uzbekistan, thanks to the uh, kind offer of the government of Uzbekistan. And furthermore, next year, you know, every day, every year for the World Soil Day celebration, which is on 5th of December, we have a team. Next year is the full year is dedicated to salt affected soils, where we will work a lot in advocacy and awareness raising, but again, technically as well, producing all those products that I showed. I hope this, well, in case you have any doubt or suggestion, I'm ready to, to answer. And thank you very much again for the opportunity. And I know that maybe you were expecting already the final map of this global status, but very soon you will have it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ronald. This is a very, uh, you know, very important session and where you mentioned that by April next year, there will be GSS map. And this is a very good thing. A harmonizing of those things are very, very important, particularly for the people who are working on salinity. So, and the Q&A session will be in the later. So if you are there, it's okay. If you are not there, we will convey to you and then you can answer that later on also. So thank you very much for, from your busy time, you could just manage to give us, you know, time particularly for the presentation of GSS update. 
thank you very much so now we go ahead with the another talk another uh, eminent speaker dr elia iskudiro he is assistant researcher economist at university of california and usda usda riverside and his talk will be on the mapping and monitoring soil salinity across scales he is environmental agronomist and his doctoral degree in 2013 he got his doctoral degree in 2013 from university of padua italy he is working as assistant research agronomist at university of california riverside environmental sciences and continuing research at usd ars us salinity lab which is very important you know in the when we talk about the salinity his research interest includes the use of geophysical near ground and remote measurements to characterize and model multi scale from field to national agro environmental soil plant processes to support sustainable agriculture and water management policies so the floor is yours dr elia please you have already shared the screen so we can start now please the floor is yours dr elia thanks very much um hi everybody uh thanks very much for the opportunity to speak uh, in front of this uh, uh very nice crowd and among these uh, uh very honorable speakers uh, it's been very interesting so far and i hope to keep it uh, at the same uh, uh level as uh, as the previous speakers um so well uh, i'm going to give uh, uh perhaps a um a short overview of uh, uh the techniques that we are using uh here um in california and across the, the the us for mapping salinity in agricultural soils mostly irrigated agricultural soils uh both of the field scale and also at a broader scales uh so before we had like a brief introduction of myself but uh, uh what we do in my lab um is basically try to integrate field measurements with uh geophysics both at the field scale with the, and uh a much broader scales with satellite imagery to inform uh, uh precision agriculture and uh, uh soil mapping at uh, at uh, at various scales so that we can help growers and um, relationships and they can best uh, use their their natural resources especially here in California where uh, we are farming in a very water scarce environment um so the team uh, over here is comprises of me and a uh, uh, few support scientists uh but uh, to the people uh, listening here if you guys are interested in uh, coming as a visiting scientist or sending your students uh please contact me because we are always open to 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 receive guests for uh brief periods of times so as uh, previously um um said but by, uh, by dr vargas uh when we talk about salinity and uh, especially in agriculture uh we refer uh, to the presence of major soluble ions in the soil solution and uh here at the salinity lab um in 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 the US in general we measure it as the electric conductivity of a saturated soil extract basically we do sample soils and then we saturate it with the um the i water and we extract this solution and then we measure the electric conductivity of the solution and this measure uh, allow us to uh, classify soils from non saline to extremely saline uh, saline uh, with the uh, comment that most of crops that we grow uh, uh, at the commercial scale uh, are don't grow in the extremely saline class uh, so growers are very interested here uh, in maintaining their soils at the uh, lower uh, salinity classes um so as just said we are around 1 billion hectares of a uh, uh, land that is salt affected in the in, in around the planet but what's most importantly i think is that 20% of the irrigated farmland is uh, affected by salinity and this is uh, the irrigated farmland around the globe from the statistics that i have uh, is uh, indicated to provide half of the uh, of the food for 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 the entire planet so 50% of this um, irrigated farmland affected by soil salinity is found in four countries uh, china india pakistan and and the united states um so here for the united states most of the Uh, salinity uh, is found in the west uh, of the US from uh, west of the Mississippi the river Mississippi and a lot here in the US southwest so California uh, Arizona New Mexico and a little bit in Colorado and Utah um the information that we have here from the um uh, from the department of agriculture uh, comes from uh, surveys that are done with traditional soil surveys and they are generally uh, referring to uh Uh, assigning uh, salinity uh, values to entire soil classes 
and, and generally they are sampled uh, in uh, non-irrigated soils. Uh, so the way that they, they do it, they go and they dig a pedon and they assign a salinity measured in that non-irrigated pedon to the entire soil class. So this provides information that is um, some uh, accurate for, for sure, but it's not really uh, a detail for the, the fields that are irrigated and uh, under the control from the farmers. Uh, and as well, uh, these are not, this is not information that, that comes at the very high resolution uh, within a single field, but it's uh, instead uh, more detailed for uh, bigger regions. Uh, so with the scope of providing the growers with the higher resolution soil information, we uh, here at the Salinity Lab work a lot on uh, using of uh, uh, um, geophysical measurements to, 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 to map soil, soil uh, uh, spatial variability at different scales. So when we go uh, in irrigated fields here in California, we often observe the fact that we have higher, uh, high uh, heterogeneity of uh, salinity at the field scale. Sometimes you can see uh, soil crusts uh, uh, emerging at the soil surface, but most of the salt uh, is uh, often found below the soil surface uh, throughout the root zone. So the, we need a, a geophysical methods that can allow us to profile entire soil profiles without uh, digging uh, thousands and thousands of soil samples. So what we do is that we use a combination of uh, traditional soil sampling and high resolution geophysical measurements to map them and monitor salinity at the, at the field scale. And the major uh, geophysical measurement that we use is the measurement of upper, apparent ele electrical soil conductivity, also uh, 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 called ECA. And this can be measured either through electrical resistivity or, or electromagnetic induction, providing depth uh, measurements across different depths of the soil profile. And this is an, a measurement that is a complex measurement that just tells you how well electrical conductivity goes through a soil profile. And it depends a lot on uh, salinity, water content, the, the soil texture, presence of gravel or not, and other soil properties. So uh, out of, the, um, of these many soil properties, salinity and water content are the ones that are most transient. And so uh, the variability, the temporal variability of these measurements, uh, of these uh, variables, uh, properties inside the soil will determine how uh, the, uh, the sensor uh, readings are, uh, are, um, are in, uh, uh, over time. So the idea uh, that, we, that we followed when we want to map salinity is that we want to standardize as much as possible the contents of water, uh, of water in the soil. Therefore, we always uh, uh, try to carry out our sensor surveys when we have, uh, uh, right after an irrigation or uh, right after a precipitation event. Uh, and this is um, uh, an assumption that, that, that stands very well after, uh, in uh, flood and uh, sprinkler irrigators, uh, irrigations, irrigated soils, excuse me, uh, because they are or, or horizontally homogeneous. Whereas it doesn't work as well in uh, micro uh, irrigated soils such as drip or micro sprinklers, but we are doing some research as well on how to best carry out uh, uh, ECA measurements in these uh, uh, drip irrigated soil profiles. So because ECA is a function of very complex uh, uh, interaction between soil properties, we always need to calibrate it to some laboratory measurements that we do. And uh, during the past 40 years or so, Dennis Corwin here at the Salinity Lab and his colleagues uh, before, and, uh, before him have developed uh, uh, protocols to do field scale soil mapping, uh, which include uh, going out and do this uh, apparent electrical conductivity survey, then using the spatial variability of the sensor survey to identify representative location where to go and do the soil sampling. Of course, do the hard work and go to the lab and do the, the laboratory analysis. And then uh, through statistics or, or geostatistics, try to um, tie that sensor information to the, to the laboratory analysis so that we can finally produce a soil map that is uh, of use to the, to the grower. Um, so this is uh, for, the sh for the short scale and, the, for, and at the field scale. But when uh, we look at uh, larger scales, we observe that um, often enough, um, there is very high heterogeneity also between uh, neighboring fields because uh, most of the time, uh, different growers use different water management or have access to different water sources. So here's an example that I'd like to show of two pistachio fields in uh, Central California planted around the same time over the, so the same soil, uh, uh, soil series, uh, uh, um, a clay loam, uh, but with a problem that 
uh, grower on the south have uh, has uh, uh, access to the water from the California aqueduct, which is very good quality water. Whereas grower here in the north, here on the left, uh, that doesn't have access to the same water because it belongs to a different water district, and it's been irrigated for the past. 16 years or so, it's pistachios orchard with the, uh, with the water from uh, their own well. Uh, and, and you can see from like this uh, uh, Google Maps screenshot, uh, how different the crop output is just by uh, using different water on, with the same crop in, this, in the same soil series. So in order to capture these uh, different uh, um, heterogeneities at different scales, uh, we use uh, high resolution remote sensing uh, so that we can capture these processes uh, uh, at different scales from like the, within the field, between neighboring fields and across an entire region. So uh, the way that we do this is uh, through the uh, uh, reflectance of uh, a crop. Uh, and so we look at the, at the crop performance uh, because we know that uh, as salinity affects crop growth and uh, the, the more salinity you have, the, the, the more stress the crop, the crop you, you, you will have on the, on, on the ground. So we mostly use data from Landsat for now, but we're also using nowadays data from uh, Planet Labs that comes at uh, a resolution of uh, 3.5 meters. But most of the preliminary study with, that we've done, we've done with, uh, with Landsat. And we are using uh, the reflectance from the blue, red, green, and near infrared to calculate a variety of uh, vegetation indices. And we, uh, we uh, stumble, let's say, upon this uh, CRSI index that is the one that best uh, maps salinity for uh, the U.S. Southwest at this point. And here, of course, you have that higher uh, crop uh, health on the vegetation would give you a higher index value, whereas a stress crop vegetation would give you uh, a lower uh, 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 index value. Unfortunately, though, this is not a direct measurement of soil salinity because it also depends on uh, uh, the relative crop status uh, from uh, water, stratu, uh, water status or nutrient status. And also depends a lot on the different crop types because of different chlorophyll contents and different leaf uh, uh, physiologies in different type of crops. Uh, and also at the growth stage that the crop is at. And as well, it depends a lot on the background uh, soil uh, reflectance as well. So uh, it depends on texture, soil organic carbon, iron content in the soil background, and as well presence or not of soil or soil crusts. So, um, well, just a side note that uh, together with crop re uh, reflectance in the visible and near infrared, one can use the thermal, uh, thermal infrared as well. But the idea is, is that all these satellite measurements are not a direct indicator of soil salinity. It's very hard to, 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 to tie that directly to soil salinity. So we need uh, ground truth uh, sampling and also we need techniques to um, screen out the noise from confounding factors. And the way that we do this um, is through the analysis of uh, multi-year time series data. And with the idea that under similar management, uh, the salinity stress is in, uh, in a short period of time and throughout the, the, the root zones of the average root zone soil salinity remains fairly constant. Uh, um, um, and therefore, like the, the plant performance, if we measure it uh, as uh, with these vegetation indices, such as CRSI, is at maximum when all the other uh, sources of stress are at, at minimum. So, if we take the, the, at each location the maximum performance over a, a multiple year time window, that performance we can assume that is only reduced by the presence of salinity. And therefore we can build a, a relative uh, a relationship between CRSI uh, and the measure salinity on the ground. So if we take the maximum uh, CRSI for, for, for a year at a single pixel, then we can uh, tie that down and you use it as a, as a predictor for soil salinity. Uh, so what we did to, to test this is we went out in the Central Valley, which is like one of the most uh, uh, importantly uh, uh, productive, uh, product, important productive areas for, for the United States and for California. Uh, we grow a variety of crop over here from uh, stable crops to specialty crops. And we have the western side of the San Joaquin Valley, which is the southern part of the Central Valley, that is uh, affected by salinity, both from uh, primary and secondary salinity. Um, so we went out there and we uh, targeted 22 fields and we sampled them. Uh, we did uh, soil surveys, as uh, we I explained previously, in all of them. And then we tried to map, uh, we mapped salinity at each of them, uh, mapping the average soil, prop, uh, soil salinity for the zero to 1.2 meter soil profile. 
And, and we did it in the method that, we, that I explained before. So we go out, we do the soil survey with the soil sensors. Then we um, sample the soils. We tie it statistically to, uh, to, to the sensor measurements. And then from the sensor measurements, we do a map of soil salinity at the same resolution of the satellite product that we are trying to map. And then we use these as the ground truth for our remote sensing model. So by using this multi-year analysis approach, we uh, uh, can increase the, the accuracy, the, 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 um, the capabilities of a remote sensing imagery to uh, represent the spatial variability of soil salinity. So if you take the uh, best correlation year that you can find, uh, it will always perform worse than, uh, than putting together multiple years and finding the, the maximum performance in, the, uh, in, in, that, in a specific year. So, if you then use this as your primary uh, explanatory variable or your primary predictor, then you can add other covariates such as like what crop type you're growing in a, in a specific field for a specific year, what is the meteorology in the year that uh, you are, have identified as the year of, uh, of best production for a single location, uh, what is this other soil information that is available such as texture, elevation and such, and what type of management do you have? Can, do you know if you have flood irrigation or if you have sprinkler irrigation and so on and so forth? So putting together all the information that we have for the Central Valley, we could uh, find a model that has pretty good uh, goodness of fit. Uh, and here in the graph, we have what we measured with the ground surveys and what we estimate with remote sensing. And we can see that the, the predictions are very close to the one-to-one -one line, which would be the, 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 perfect, mo the perfect model. Um, so, uh, the job is not done though, because uh, once we develop a model, we do uh, the, the, the uh, hard work uh, to try to uh, evaluate it. So, we evaluate it statistically through cross-validation techniques, as well we go out and uh, uh, collect independent data. And also, work that we do uh, here is to go and talk to the growers and show them the map and uh, ask them if the, if the map is... Uh, representing some information that they might already have for a few selected fields in their, in their, uh, uh, in their farms. So once all this is done and, uh, and we decide that the map is, uh, uh, is uh, satisfactorily accurate, then we can produce these regional scale soil maps that come at a very high resolution and are, uh, and are highly accurate. So now the work that we are doing now is that uh, from this pilot study, we are expanding to the entire US Southwest uh, with some funding from uh, the, the, the Department of Agriculture. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to use this spatial information on soil salinity to uh, help growers to plan for their irrigation for a specific growing season. So we can take these salinity values and do crop uh, projections. Uh, and uh, uh, according to the water type that they have at their farm, uh, growers can decide to irrigate to, uh, to, to meet certain yield goals. So this is uh, all I have for today. And thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, so these are my, my contacts. Uh, if you have uh, further questions for uh, maybe the, the next few days, uh, the main references that we talked about today are in these two papers. And if you cannot access them, uh, don't hesitate to write me an email uh, and I can send them to you. And here's uh, the other links for uh, the grant that is funding the, this research currently and uh, uh, my own lab. Many thanks, Dr. Elia. Many thanks for your very detailed analysis and then how you are going from that small scale to the large scale and extrapolating the things. It's very nice, particularly for the salinity researcher. And thank you very much. So because the time is constrained, so I will go straight away to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Devender Sandhu. He is going to speak on the genetic characterization of salt tolerance mechanism in the fruit and forage crops. For his brief introduction, he is a research geneticist at GUSDA Riverside, California since 2015. His major work is on salinity and he is professor in University of Wisconsin from 2005 to 2015. Before that, he was in Iowa State University and he did his PhD from University of Nebraska, Lincoln. So just uh, not to waste my time, I will just give the floor to Dr. Devinder Sandhu. Dr. Sandhu, you can share the screen and you can start now. So please stick to the time. Thank you very much.
Dr. Sandhu, you can... Yeah, I, I, I was just sharing the screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. R.K. Singh for, for the introduction. And uh, I would also like to uh, uh, thank Dr. Sharma and Dr. Uh, uh, Jad for the invitation. So, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to shift some gears here. So until now we were just talking about soil, I'm going to move to plants from soil. Today I'm going to talk about uh, salt tolerance mechanisms uh, in forage and nut crops. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about alfalfa and almonds. So first, starting with the alfalfa experiment. Dr. Sandhu, we cannot see your screen so far. Can you share oh. the screen, please? On the bottom, there is a share screen, green button, and then choose yeah. the screen which you want to share. Yeah. Do you see it now? No, no, not yet. Hmm. You have to choose, the, first you click the share screen, then there will be many screens. In that, then go to the it. screen, yes. This, it's coming, yes, good. Can you see now? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, let me go back then. So as I mentioned that first I'm going to be talking about our alfalfa experiment. So in this experiment, uh, we screened 2,700 different alfalfa genotypes. Uh, under very high uh, saline conditions, uh, 18.5 decimal per meter and 24.5 uh, decimal per meter conditions. Uh, and out of this experiment, we were able to uh, select 12 different genotypes. Here on, uh, you can see these 12 genotypes. And for this presentation, I'll be just calling the numbers for these genotypes from one to 12. And these genotypes were selected based on biomass, high, low, or medium, and also iron concentrations, sodium, chloride, and potassium. So again, you can see low, medium, and high. So we did, uh, we cloned these plants, uh, asexually propagated, and did a, uh, a replicated uh, trial. So here you can see that, uh, we are looking at salt tolerance index and biomass on x-axis. Two genotypes here, genotype three and 10, the salt tolerance index is close to one. What does that mean is the performance under salinity and performance under control is very similar. So salt tolerance index is performance under salinity divided by performance under control. So these two genotypes are performing same as they were performing under control condition. So similar performance under salinity. So then we wanted to see that uh, uh, this biomass which they are producing, what are the different component traits which are contributing towards this biomass? So first trait we looked at was uh, shoot height. Uh, for shoot height, you can see that this is a control condition, this is uh, under salinity. So all of the genotypes, they showed some reduction in shoot height but there was not much correlation uh, with salt tolerance index. On the other hand, you can look at the shoots per plant. Again, you see there is, there is some reduction in shoots per plant for most of, the, most of the genotypes, but you look at these two genotypes, three and 10, which I showed you on the previous slide. So this is even producing more shoots under salinity as compared to the control. So here there is almost like similar number of shoots. So that tells you that uh, the increase in biomass in these two genotypes is coming from this uh, component rate shoots per plant, not from the shoot height. So when we looked at iron concentration, sodium ion concentration and chloride ion concentration, control and salinity. So you can look at under saline condition, of course, chlorine concentration is going up 
in most of these genotypes. But again, you don't see much difference here in different genotypes. So all of them, they are showing a huge increase in chloride concentration. But when you look at sodium uh, in a sodium tissue concentration in the leaves, so here you can see, sorry. It's still, can you see it still? Yes, we can see that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So for sodium, you can, somehow it is not working. It's okay. So <clears throat> for sodium, you can see the genotype, which was uh, genotype three. So it did not show huge increase in sodium concentration. And there's lots of variation in other genotypes. So that tells you that sodium concentration is very important in alpha alpha. Uh, so we have studied many different uh, types of plants for salinity tolerance and uh, try to classify these genotypes based on the ionic to uh, toxicity. And some of, the, some of the plant species, they sh show sodium toxicity, some they show chloride toxicity, sometimes both are important. So that's what we wanted to differentiate here. So the alpha alpha sodium is very important uh, and that causes toxicity. So then we looked at uh, gene expression, expression analysis on several different component rates. So here you can see sodium efflux from the root to soil, and there are several genes involved in that. Sequestration of sodium in the vacuoles, and these are the responsible genes. Retrieval of sodium from xylem back into the root, antioxidants and organic solutes, and then some genes involved in signal transduction. So here on the top, you can see different genotypes. Uh, genotype 1 to 12, uh, this is leaf and root, and then C is control, T is salt treatment. <clears throat> so when you look at expression, so green color represents low expression and red color represents high expression. <clears throat> so when you compare these, for example, uh, genotype 3 and 10, you can see both the genotype, they are showing some upregulation of genes which are involved in sodium efflux from the root to soil. So, so same here in tan, you can see that. <clears throat> so then if you look at some genes which are involved in sequestration of sodium in the vacuole, you see that genotype three does not show much differential expression under control and short condition. Whereas you can see some different differential expression in genotype 10. So higher expression in this case uh, under salinity condition. So then also here, for example, for antioxidants and organic solutes, you can see not much difference here, but there uh, P5CS1 is showing little upregulation in gene expression. So the purpose of this experiment was to classify genotypes based on different component traits. So one is better, for example, three is, uh, both of them, they are involved in uh, sodium efflux, but three does not have a good mechanism to sequester uh, sodium in the vacuole, but 10 does. Both of them, three and 10 are good genotype, but they are still very different with respect to, with respect to the uh, uh, component rates we are studying. So the next, uh, what we wanted to do was try to, cross these genotypes to bring these, these traits together, pyramid these, these traits together into a single genotype. So out of these 12 genotypes, I selected five genotypes, which are pretty uh, diverse from each other in terms of different component traits and made crosses for those uh, genotypes and then generated F2 populations. Uh, and this is example of one of the F2 population we are uh, evaluating in uh, sand tanks. <clears throat> so in this population, we are able to identify several different genotypes which can take half sea water very easily. So we are further evaluating these genotypes and planning to release those genotypes in germ plan release. So here, this is the first, uh, first part of uh, my talk uh, about alfalfa. So now I'm going to move to uh, nut trees uh, like almonds. <clears throat> so we are working on almonds for last several years. Almonds are very important in California. California produces about like 90% of almonds in the world and salinity is big problem for almonds. 
So Almond Board of California is continuously funding us to do salinity research on almonds. <clears throat> so I started working on uh, different rootstocks, so commercial rootstocks, which are grown in California. <clears throat> so I started the study with 14 different uh, commercial rootstocks. And we use five different types of uh, irrigation water. So different composition. The treatment one was control. Treatment two to treatment five. They were all salinity treatment with the three decimal per meter. Uh, almonds are very sensitive to salt, so you can't go very high. <clears throat> but these treatment two, two to treatment five, they're a little different in terms of their composition because we wanted to know uh, which ions are more important for uh, almond root stocks. So here treatment two is uh, predominantly uh, sodium and sulfate. Uh, treatment three, sodium and chloride predominantly. So here we have mixed uh, anions, chloride and sulfate, and sodium as cation. So in this, we have calcium, magnesium, and chloride and sulfate as anions. So these 14 different uh, rootstocks, actually they come from different, uh, different uh, species of prunus. So there are several different combinations, plum-based, peach-based, peach hybrids, peach-plum hybrids. So there are lots of different combinations which are used as rootstocks in almonds. So in first experiment, when we lo looked at the survival rates uh, under uh, salinity conditions, uh, first thing we saw that there was maximal reduction in survival rate uh, in treatment three, which is predominantly sodium chloride based treatment. Uh -huh. Then when you compare treatment two and treatment three, so this is sodium sulfate. So it tells you there is a big reduction with sodium then there's a further reduction with chloride. So that tells you that both sodium and chloride are important for Brunus. When you look at these different genotypes here, uh, some of the genotypes, they performed real well uh, for their survival rate. Uh, for example, Imperium, Cornerstone, Bright Hybrid 5, they did really well uh, under saline conditions. On the other hand, Lovell, Guardian, Root Pack 20, Root Pack R, they were, they were really uh, sensitive to salinity. Dr. Sandhu, can you please summarize quickly? Okay, I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. <clears throat> so, uh, so then what you look at is ion concentration. As I mentioned in alpha-alpha that uh, you look at ions. Uh, here in this case, we are looking at sodium. Interestingly, these genotypes, Imperial Cornerstone, they store very little amount of sodium. And uh, when you look at chloride, same thing, these genotypes, Imperial, Viking, Nichols, they store very little amount of uh, chloride in their, in their leaves. And then you look at potassium. Potassium it normally will have a negative relationship with sodium. But we, it was very interesting to see that Imperium 1, which had very low amount of sodium, it has the lowest amount of potassium too. So then we looked carefully for potassium. It is not the total concentration of potassium. It is that how much potassium is reduced in salinity as compared to the control. So the genotypes where you see biggest reduction here, uh, this is control, these are uh, salinity treatments. So biggest reduction in root R, Guardian. So these two genotypes are sensitive genotypes. So potassium concentration, how much reduction there is, that is more important than overall concentration. And we were also able to look at some physiological and biochemical uh, uh, parameters. So most important one out of that was proline concentration. If you take proline ratio, salinity divided by control, if the proline values are uh, close to one. So these genotypes, they store less chloride, less sodium, and the survival rate is high. So proline can be used as a uh, biochemical marker to screen genotypes which are tolerant to salt. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. What I want to say here is when you compare different genotypes, this is gene expression, so many genes we studied. So what you see here is the basic expression in tolerant genotypes is a lot higher 
than sensitive genotypes. You see green, more green here than here. So basic expression is more important than compar comparison of salinity versus control. And we were also able to do some functional analysis uh, where we took one of the important gene, HKT1, and we transformed that uh, into a Rabidopsis mutant, uh, ATHKT1, which is very sensitive to salt. So these two are transgenic lines with Prunus uh, HKT1. So they perform really well. So you can look at relative dry weight, mutant versus transgenic lines, and survival uh, percent survival rate, mutant versus uh, transgenic lines. So we were able to show that there is function complementation of this gene and the, uh, the function is conserved in Prunus and Arabidopsis. So quickly to summarize, uh, in alfalfa, sodium was more important, whereas for almond, sodium and chloride, both are important. And we are able to uh, classify genotypes based on the species they came from. The peach-based hybrid and peach almond based hybrids are more tolerant than plum based uh, rootstocks. Uh, and for potassium, as I mentioned, the reduction in potassium is more important than overall potassium concentration. And we were able to show some functional complementation using one of the genes we identified was important and we complemented the function in a reduction mutant. So Thank I would you, like to thank. USDA and Armored Board of California for funding this research. So we have lots of undergraduate students and several collaborators in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandhu. Thank you very much for your very deep uh, and very upstream talk about the expression analysis of the gene, etc. HKT you use, which is also being used in the rice also. So thank you very much because the time is limited. So I will just go through the next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Mohammad Mainuddin, he's a principal research scientist at CSIRO Land and Water in Canberra, Australia. His talk, the title of the talk is Impact of Climate Change, Food, Flood Inundation and Management Strategies on Water and Salt Balance of the Polders and Islands in the Ganges Delta. He's currently leading a project in the in ICR, the ACIR on improving dry season agriculture for marginal and tenant farmers in the Eastern Gangetic Plain through conjunctive use of pond and groundwater resources. He was senior research scientist at CSIRO from 2010 to 2016. And also he did his postdoc from the IMI, Sri Lanka. And uh, he was also a research engineer in AIT, Bangkok. And before that, he started his career in Bari, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute in Ghazipur. He has about 30 years of research experience in integrated water resource management, modeling for river basins, irrigation systems, performance analysis, agriculture productivity and food security analysis, socioeconomic and livelihood issues related to the water use. Thank you very much, Dr. Manidun, to accept our invitation. And the floor is yours because we have limited time. So please stick to the time. Thank you very much. Please go uh, ahead. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, the, yeah, I will try to uh, maintain the time. So the uh, talk, uh, title of my talk, as you can see, is the impact of climate change, flood inundation management strategies uh, uh, on this water and soil balance of the polar islands in the Ganges Delta. Uh, this is a, a, a this research is done as part of a project that I will come later on to describe. So if we look at the Ganges Delta. Can you hear me? And is all okay? Yes, Hello? very well. Very yeah. well. So uh, the coastal zone of the Ganges Delta, as you can see, this this part. This is a, a Bangladesh and and the west part of West Bengal. And this area is low lying delta region. The ground level in what we call is the polder. Uh, ground level is a. a the below the the mean sea uh, the water level surrounding the polder so these areas as you can see in the map uh, below is dyke that is they are protected from flooding uh, uh, by using the dikes around the polder so in west bengal we have similar kind of uh, of system though they don't call it polder but they call it uh, um, islands but they are all protected uh, land by the dikes so they are uh, affected by salinity, particularly the low-lying region. 
and there are varying degree of salinity in the soil. Uh, there is a, only one crops can be grown in the in the in this region that is in the monsoon season that is called curry rice or in Bangladesh they called almond rice. And this area is is for poverty because they have only one crop and there is a very limited livelihood opportunities. Uh, so we have been working uh, for a project that is called cropping system intensification in the salt affected coastal zone of Bangladesh in West Bengal. That project is funded by the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research and Krishi Gobeshana Foundation of Bangladesh. So we have uh, just finished the first phase of the project of five years, started in 2015. We just finished this October and we are going to start the second phase. In fact, it started already from 1st of November for another four years. So we have, a, I am representing CSIRO and we have Mardog University as a partner who is in Australian University. We have a, a several institutions from Bangladesh, Bari, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, Rice Research Institute, Kulna University. And many of my colleagues are already uh, now listening to this presentation, they, they uh, logged in. And from India, CSSRI, ICAR CSSRI is our partner, Vidhan Chandra Krishi Vishu Vidyalai and an NGU called uh, Tagore Society for Rural Development. This is a fairly large project and we have four main component. One is that how we manage the polders because whatever we do inside the polders, that is the cropping, it depends on how we manage the polder, how we manage the drive dikes, how we manage the, the regulator that is draining or bring water in. Then we have done a lot of uh, crop related modeling to understand the salinity processes of the crop. We conducted series of uh, uh, field experiments to, uh, with many different crops. And we also looked at the socioeconomic and community aspects. So I'm not going into the detail of uh, these, what we have done. Rather, I just going through skipping uh, uh, through some of the slide just to show you that the impact of the project. We have tested many different things in the project, like zero tillage potato, uh, uh, drip irrigation, different so, uh, introducing different salt tolerant varieties, different ways of irrigation, crop establishment method, and many other techniques to establish crop, particularly in the dry season, and also to improve the productivity of the crop in the Corif season or almond rice. Uh, this project is uh, fairly well uh, publicized in the local uh, electronic and news media. As you can see, that is in Bangladesh and also in West Bengal. Uh, our scientists are interviewed by the television channels and, and our um, activities are oil reported in the newspaper. What I'm going to explain one part of the project that is very unique that uh, about the salt and water balance at the polder level. Because how we manage the salt and water within the polder are largely determined that what sort of crop we can grow inside the polders. So the, the polder model we have developed uh, is a fairly unique model that, uh, uh, on, uh, that I am showing you a cross section of a polder. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, that is the river in both sides, that, that is the dike, and then there is a dike, as you can see, this is the dikes. Uh, and then inside the polders, we have canal and ponds, then there is crops, and crops then interact with the soil, groundwater, groundwater is also saline. So how we model these processes, uh, we did, and then this is a lumped monthly model uh, we used. So I'm not going into detail about the model development. So we, we have then applied this model or we based this model in three different polders uh, uh, with varying degree of salinity, like Amtoli, which is a area in, uh, in Potuakali region, Borishal region, this is a polder. Then Dakop is in near Khulna, this is, a, uh, this is low salinity, this is medium salinity, and Gosaba Island is in Sundarban region of uh, West Bengal, which has a very high salinity. So we tested our model uh, in three different uh, uh, salinity conditions so that it represents the, the uh, all salinity conditions within the Ganges Delta. So we obviously uh, calibrated the model oil, first of all, with the observation that we have conducted in the field. And we have also done the detailed crop modeling with rice, wheat, maize, and lentil, grass pea, uh, 
using this EPSIM. EPSIM is a crop model. Uh, many of you know about maybe about EPSIM. This is called the Agricultural Productivity Simulator, or this is a similar model like DSET. Many of you know about DSET. So we can understand the, uh, the, uh, the salinity processes within the crop root zone and how it uh, works. Uh, and then using this result, uh, we have uh, trained our uh, uh, our polder model to calibrate this. So this is shows the calibration at uh, using EPSIM results. So it shows different parameter of the polder model that we used for calibration. And this is for Gosaba, as you can see. We use that model then to run different scenarios of management because now already this area is saline. And in the future, this area is is considered one of the most affected area due to climate change because there will be sea level rise which may inundate the whole area there will be changes in the in the flooding and and the condition there is extreme value event like the the cyclones that recently happened as you know the cyclone amphan the gosaba and the our dakup area is very highly affected by cyclone amphan that happens in a few uh, in may so we use that model to understand that what will happen in the future in terms of salinity, in terms of water balance, and, and what will happen if we go for cropping. So again, we used 28 ZCM models uh, and um, of the uh, latest AR5 projection and RCP5 scenarios. And then using this 28 GCM, we, we use the ensemble of uh, those models to understand to consider the boundary like low rainfall and high rainfall, low uh, ET and high ET, so, and then average, so that we understand the, the range of uncertainty within those models. We used uh, a lot of uh, management scenarios as well, uh, like uh, base case, uh, uh, which is now currently quarry fries and fellow. Then we looked at the what will happen if we just continue the current practice uh, with blaze case and climate change scenario. Then we have looked at the different management scenarios, like what will happen if there is cropping in the dry season, because that altered the salinity condition in the soil. Then if we, what happened if we pump groundwater for drainage, like lower the groundwater table to drain the saline groundwater so that we can create a freshwater lens and above the salinity, saline groundwater, uh, so that that uh, crop root zone will not be affected by salinity. So if we, the what happened if we don't use any irrigation from the river? What will happen if we use more canal and ponds to store water and then use it for irrigation? And then if we, what happened if we use or forced to use uh, uh, river water, slightly saline river water for irrigation? Then we have also applied those uh, uh, cell, uh, with the climate change scenarios. We also looked at that what will happen if there is a sea level rise in the future that is predicted uh, uh, in the IPCC. So here are some of the results as, as you can see. This is the base case plus climate change scenario. With the base case, uh, the rainfall varies because of the climate change projection. And we can see that uh, ET will also vary. So not much a change in terms of ET as there is no extra crop. Then if you look at the base place uh, on the salinity of the soil, this is the drainage parameter. That is how the drainage or runoff will be affected uh, by climate change. This is salinity of the soil. This is salinity of the pond and canal. And this is groundwater salinity. As you can see, I'm not going into detail into the result, uh, but that uh, as you can see with the climate change, all these parameters will significantly vary. As you can see, salinity of the soil varies so is the, uh, the salinity of the ponds and other conditions. So this information gives us how we can plan our uh, cropping uh, uh, for, the cro uh, for the dry season or the robust season. Then if you look at the management scenarios, again, that there are a lot of management scenarios if we consider like uh, rice wheat and then groundwater pumping, uh, managing of uh, more water for the pond, no river water or river water for irrigation. Again, we can see that uh, uh, that these berries, use of river water increases salinity, as you can see the salinity of the pond or salinity of the soil. If we increase the, uh, the river water, if it increases the river water, similarly that uh, uh, the irrigation increases 
uh, and then that increases the the changes the balance of uh, salinity in the soil and in the pond and in the in the drainage so again this information help us how we can plan to manage the salinity in the soil to grow crop in the dry season and also in the corrif season if we look at the robi crops uh, and then salinity like uh, as you can see that if we consider the the higher rainfall here uh, then higher rainfall means uh, more uh, drainage because of the more runoff and that would means that less salinity so in future if there is high rainfall projected and it happens that would help us to manage salinity better because we can we can run um, and the and the flush down the salinity we also looked at the uh, other scenarios like uh, if what happens if there is a breach of uh, of the polders and there is a sudden rise of uh, of inundation because of the sea level surge that what happened in recently in gosaba many of you know there was a breach of the uh, embankment and the whole area is flooded by the sea water then how much time it requires to recover the soil so we need there is a time that we cannot grow any crop but we can predict by using this model what will happen uh, and how much time it will require to uh, to, uh, to recrop the soil or to for recropping so we we uh, look at three different scenarios like there is no breaching that is no in the in these may as you know there are two cyclone season in bangladesh or in the in that part of the world one is in april may this time it was amphan cyclone amphan was in may and then another season is currently that is in november the biggest cyclone happen in the history of bangladesh or in that region was in 12th november 1970 where on reportedly 1 million people died so that washed away everything the coastal region so with this model what i am not going to detail on the results what we can predict is that how flood will affect the salinity of the soil salinity of the groundwater salinity of the drainage soil and then how rec uh, fast we can recover that what how much time it will take to recover the soil so that it will be ready for uh, for cropping again so that kind of scenarios we can pr uh, 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 predict by using this model so i'm not going into detail on this result because of time but if anyone is interested we can share the detail so just to show you that what the capability of the model how and how it can help us to to in the planning of the cropping planning of the polders and how we can manage this salinity for better management of this area for higher cropping so i am coming to the conclusion so again as is that that uh, because it's this uh, saline area and it's no wonder that uh, how we manage the salinity is the key how we can grow crop in the soil so uh, managing the salinity in the root zone as well as managing the overall salinity within the polder is very important and we can through this model we can devise the strategy how we can remove the soil uh, uh, the carefully manage the sluice gates and canals to manage the salinity within the polder or outside the polder so that it is it will not affect the the cropping and similarly how we can uh, use the groundwater strategic groundwater pumping to remove salty water uh, from the fresh water storage to create a, cell, uh, a fresh water lens uh, below the crop root zone so uh, the model uh, uh, as i said can be useful to this kind of planning Uh, for the future of the uh, uh, of the coastal zone so we have several papers that published so anyone is interested so the main pair model paper is published in the journal of hydrology and also we have published one in the iskar journal uh, indian society of coastal agriculture research there are two other papers in the in the review so anyone is interested please uh, uh, let us know we can share the paper with you and i with this uh, uh, i uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the australian government and the acr and my colleagues who are also listening to this presentation from institute of water modeling bari bri cssri bckb and tsrd kulna university and mardok university thank you very much thank you very much dr manindin for the very good work particularly in the very 
a specific area which is marred by the so many typhoons etc and probably your models will be definitely utilized and people can have your email and they can talk to you maybe um, like a personally also so because as i mentioned that time is very limited yeah. so so now the next talk uh, i will be the one who will be talking about that so and my topic is crop diversification key for the productivity in salt affected marginal environments so i can go through that quickly Oops. why the window is closed sorry for that glitch why deactivate see this one so it's a second with me anyway it's okay so again once again good morning good afternoon and good evening to everybody and i have the talk on the crop diversification i will be talking more on the how we can utilize the crop diversification factor for the productivity in the salt affected marginal environments if you talk about that plant species which are available in world it's more than 400000 plant species we are there they are identified in the planet and 30000 has been known to be edible from literature or somewhere else but if you talk about that how many them of Uh, like has been used as a food it's around 6000 which has been which has been documented as the food food items your screen But, is not shared doctor oh sorry wait which has been written where is it presentation you can you see this one yes yes now it is okay so is it visible now yes 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 okay thank you very much sorry for the interruption and sometime it happened because of the glitches Uh, i will just so uh, as we were discussing about that 400000 plant species and 30000 known to be edible but in the documented it's only 6000 somewhere which has been used as a food out of that if you go to the supermarket or somewhere you can find not more than 150 crops which are cultivated on the significant scale and you can find them in the supermarket as a food so main thing is that its challenge is that can we have more more type of foods because otherwise our calorific and our requirement is coming from mostly rice maize and wheat and it's 60% of calorific requirement is coming from these and if we talk about the pot potato also it becomes around 70 to 75% so this is the reason you know one big reason why we are getting only the carb rich food and there is a problem of the malnutrition and malnutrition is not only for the like a less nutrition particularly the obesity is also one of the things so when we talk about the burden of malnutrition and you can see this on the global scale the dark blue is high bmi means obesity obesity is also one kind of malnutrition dietary risk when we they don't have the food enough food of that or the enough food with the balanced food i will say so, so this is the imbalanced food so we need to have not only food security but nutritional security where we can have the balanced food and the third one is the child and maternal undernutrition so you now you can see that because of the malnutrition since we are just stating like a three or four food we are losing around more than 20 daily that is a disability adjusted life year every year so in the whole life span and if you go to the socio development index with the low poor low index uh, low and development index countries then this becomes very high that malnutrition as well as the dietary risk and if you compare in comparison to the blood pressure the cancer and also the diabetes 
it's very very high so what we need can we rely only on those three or four major foods or we should have some other foods which can balance our nutrition or which can balance our diet so nutritional security is only when we are having more food of the diverse nature but can we do this because arable land is declining day by day because of urbanization because of encroachment because of so many things and if you see that 100 one fourth of global population live in the economic water scarcity and this is going to be people say that third world war is going to be happen on the water but this is coming up like because everybody is fighting about the water rights and water distribution in the river etc and the 40% of global population live in the marginal area so in this scenario if we can't afford to grow those four crops in the marginal environments we have to look for the different crops so demand for food is growing we need to have the crops for the different areas and for the next to by 2050 we have the 2.2 billion people extra 2.2 billion mouths extra we have to have the food from that so the food the question is can we have the food from the arable land but the food is has to come from the only like you know for the extra people from the marginal area so when we talk about the marginal areas i am talking about the biophysical environments not the marginal social status only because in this mena region sometime you can say that here is the marginal environment but the poor people are not very very poor so in that case i am talking about the mostly biophysical environments and one of them is the salt so there are many conditions salt drought high temperature low temperature there are poor soils etc but i am talking about the salt since this webinar is mostly related with the salinity so excess salt the once we have the excess salt what is the degree of the excess salt and the second thing is that can we grow anything everywhere when there is a excess salt the question is uh, it's very pertinent question with this webinar but the answer is no we can't grow everything everywhere so the thing is that we have to look for the crop diversity and this is the key so in that case in case if we say that if it is low salt stress like up to 8 decimal we can have the food and wheat crops whether it's rice wheat barley palmlet or sorghum and also the minor millet like proso millet barnyard millet you can grow them in the low salinity but if it is a high salinity or medium salt stress i will say not not high salinity medium salt stress i will say food and feed crop we have the crop like quinoa which is having very high salinity tolerance all the if we have very high we can have the barley critical because in this region the food feed security is also very very important not only food but feed security because of the very high number of live stocks and this particularly the food you can buy from the supermarket or market but feed you cannot buy immediately in case if you are having the constraint of the food uh, feed so the feed security is very important so people are growing barley tetikel palmlet etc as feed also under the high salinity if it is more then you can have the blue panicum guinea grass etc so fodder so food feed and fodder but some trend of salinity say for example where we are situated ikba our said ground water salinity is 26 decimal it is 60% of the sea water salinity so what you can grow in this one only the helopitic grasses helopitic florages and then sporobolus distichlus and pespellum are the good particular thing which are grown as a fodder and utilized for the livestock in this region however as dr isman mentioned about the sea water salinity we can grow few helopites because some of the area which are having the so high salinity we don't we can't grow anything so we have the crop every for every place the main thing is that the main uh, what i want to convey that crop diversity is the answer where you can grow something from you know uh, in the low salt stress to very high salt stress to the sea water salinity and in the salicornia it is food as well as feed it has been utilized as the fresh tip of salicornia in the up up uh, you know up um, cafe markets as the as the you know dishes in the dishes you can have like a, you know this salad etc and the crackers on the salicornia side by side you can utilize that as the feed so in this one if we talk about that the crop very the genetic variability we just just did this experiment just to show that if we talk about the palmlet ranges ranges of the salinity the palmlet has the tolerance up to like a, you know um, you can grow up to 9 or 10 decimal 
while quinoa can grow economically up to 20 days a month barley can grow which is the highest salinity tolerant crop in the food crops so barley can grow up to 10 11 or 12 even wheat is having little bit less salinity rice is having very less salinity and if we talk about the threshold salinity rice has 3 3 days a month while barley is having the most salt tolerant it's having 8 days a month as the threshold salinity quinoa has around 12 more than 12 days a month as the threshold salinity so you can imagine that this we have the crops for this thing so this is the experiment we can sh show you this is the palm millet sorghum and then uh, barley this is the barley then uh, this is maize and then amaranth and this is the quinoa and if you talk about the drought again barley and wheat i can say that there are certain varieties but if you compare that the amount of the water is needed the it doesn't compare it is it can't be compared with quinoa and palm millet as in the drought tolerant but rice you cannot say that it's uh, taking too much water in comparison to the palm millet and quinoa so not only the intercrop variability but intracrop variability just to want to share, share here you can see that it is the hydroponics so this is 0 4 8 12 16 and 20 so up to 20 days even it is growing so this is a very small small crop uh, but you can see that there are varieties which can grow very well and this is coming up to the reproductive stage and they are growing economically up to 20 days even and we have other their diversity also in the quinoa whether it's a plant height uh, color grain color or uh, other saponin content etc these are the things which we have the quite big diversity and i can say that in rikba we have the biggest diversity of the quinoa except in the south american region where it is being uh, like a staple crop on that so just to tell about that when it salinity is a 6 to 18 we are growing the crops like palm millet barley sorghum but we can say that quinoa is a superfood because quinoa is one thing which contains all nine essential amino acid for the human diet because we have we need like a 20 amino acid while 11 can be made in our body while 9 cannot be it has to be replenished from outside so this is the one crop and it is having the very high lysine which is mostly present in the animal protein but this is the one of the things which we can say that it is gluten free also so gluten intolerant people can take this quinoa very well while it has low gi glycemic index it has around glycemic index 53 so even the diabetic and diabetic people can take this quinoa this is one of the very good uh, food for the very big population of the world which are diabetic as well as gluten intolerant rich source of vitamin and also it is having much more mineral than the other crops like wheat etc just to give uh, i would like to have your attention on this thing that you can see that it has gone to the space and why because it is mentioned in the nasa technical paper while no single food can supply all the essential life sustaining nutrients quinoa comes as close as any other in the plant or animal kingdom so that way we can say that this we can boast that quinoa is one of the crop however in case if the salinity goes more than 20 days is human what you can grow we already discussed we can have the salt grass we have sporovolus we have paspalum we can grow for the feed security so if, as mentioned the feed security in the region many of the region are very important the last thing we can say that if it is a salinity is more than 35 40 days is even per meter as dr isman mentioned so this is the you can see that here the desalination plant in this middle east region 70% of desalination of the world happens here and in this once we get the one cup of the fresh water we get around two cup of the brine that's a, a, a like a, you know very very highly saline water so that brine where to grow that where to throw that one this is a big big uh, like problem so salicornia can be food and feed but this salicornia can be grown on that brine the one thing is that if you take this fresh water you can grow the vegetable so you can do whatever you want to grow the things but what to do with the brine so the thing is that brine you can grow the salicornia but this is a you know inefficiency the best thing is that we are going this uh, circulating this brine through the fish tanks where the fish saline water fish can grow over there and through the saline water fish the excreta and the feed etc that makes the water very very nutritive and that can go to the helophytic feed like salicornia or some helophytic grasses or even some of the uh, like salt tolerant food crops which can be utilized in the feed 
as a field and this thing can be utilized for the feed security in this region so this is one one thing to say that we have the option to grow the things main thing is that you can another option is you change the environment but how much resource you need to change the environment so better you use the crop diversity to utilize the land so quinoa i would like to just briefly go that we have already identified we are working on the quinoa breeding uh, like a very like intensively and we have identified donors for the trait of interest when we say trait of interest first is the low saponin variety sweet variety if the saponin content is very very low or zero then there is a less demand for the processing in that case we reduce the price on the processing and the uh, the benefit comes to the farmer are more we can have the less duration of that quinoa variety so that we can grow even the two crops within a season particularly if there is a conducive environment and also the dwarf so that the lodging will be less we are already having the jiva spana uh, so we are working on that and we are uh, work this is a second year and then we are going for the multi environment trials for the good and reliable identification of qtnf genes for the desired traits and we have we are developing high yielding sweet quinoa variety with early maturity in accordance to the product profile we made the product profile for the different region whether it's a mena cac central asia and sub saharan africa so the main thing is we which is our role is that public is becoming aware of quinoa but still more awareness is needed so acceptance of the quinoa is very big challenge in the society and in the supermarket it still it's a very costly commodity when it is packed and it is considered is still the crop of the affluent people this is a very very big bottleneck we have to change it but you can see that quinoa is a driver for nutritional security and inwa ikba is closely working with the fao and ifar to make quinoa popular along with the optimum utilization of the marginal and saline lands and poor quality water to grow superfood and you can see this one the farm gate price is 1 to 1.5 dollar and when it reaches to the market in the good packing it may it may go up to the 12 times or even up to 28 times so the same thing you know the same thing with the good processing you can do that and this main thing goes for the middleman processing charges so if we get the sweet quinoa the processing charges can be reduced a lot and it's not only the quinoa grain but quinoa couscous quinoa cookies quinoa other products can be or quinoa paste can be developed so there are different products of the quinoa and it is not like only quinoa if you produce it will be accepted we have to go for the full value chain of the quinoa on that way so just to say that about a few key take home messages food for bulging world population will have to come from the marginal environments it is imperative now inter and intra crop variable diversity should be exploited to cover the salt affected marginal areas and this is also very related to climate change adaptation but it has to be along with the mitigation in the conjunction proper crop mix is utmost importance for food and nutritional security so it's not only food but nutritional security otherwise there is a day, this stunting is there otherwise there are certain other problems also there Quinoa is the best crop for the high saline and dry climate, and saponin free quinoa varieties are the game changers. And complete value chain development is must for the proper adoption of the any crop, and higher benefits to the farmer. With this, thank you very much. And this is my institute. You can see this is in the middle of desert, but in the background you can see that it's all green. So we are working on that. The our efforts are to green the area where are salinity or where are the pe the people are facing the desert problem. Thank you very much. The floor is open for. Uh, I I will not say that because we are having the question answer. So I will go for the next speaker rather, uh, Dr. P C Sharma. So just let me uh, first of all I will stop sharing and then. Yes. So, with this, the my presentation is finished. Now, the next presentation we have from Dr. P. C. Sharma on harnessing by productivity of salt affected soils. Just to inform, Dr. Sharma is a director of Central Soil Salinity Research Institute, Karnal, and he is noted phys plant physiologist and has more than thirty years of research experience. His major work is on out understanding mechanism of salt tolerance in different crops. 
and has involved for the development of the 11 salt tolerant varieties of rice, mustard, wheat, and lentil. And presently, he is working as the director of ICR, Central Soil Strategy Research Institute, Karnal, Haryana, India. So, over to Dr. Sharma, please. Thank you, Dr. R.K. Singh. Uh, I will be speaking today on harnessing productivity of salt affected soils. And uh, when we will be Taking about talking about the national scenario, it is about 6.74 million hectares salt affected area, and which is supposed to go by 11.25 million hectares by 2030. 32 to 84 percent total groundwater use that is affected by salinity and sodicity. And when we see annual food grain loss, it is 17 million tons and around 3,000 million US dollars that is economic loss that is going to happen. The technologies which we have followed in this country, that is the gypsum technology for management of alkali soils. Until now with the, the, this technology, the cumulative area that has been reclaimed is 2.09 million hectare. And by the end of the third year of reclamation, we get the full, uh, all the crops of five tons of rice or more than four tons of wheat and all the economic analysis that has been done. But the major question that we, we are feeling as of today is, that is the increase in area under salt affected soils. And we have seen for the 20 year period from 1996 to 2016, and in this particular small state of Haryana, with the uh, salt affected soils, they have increased from 2.3 lakh hectare to 3.1 lakh hectare. And the map on the right side, that is for 2016, and on the left side, it is 1996. But on other states also, when we talk about Uttar Pradesh, also around 10 to 15 percent increase that is going to happen. And in uh, Gujarat also, the similar yield, uh, similar increase that we are facing. And due to all these things, we are having more of uh, climate affected uh, areas. And when we talk about the gypsum, it is a finite source. That is the major problem with this. It is not a finite source. And at the CSSRI, we are doing elemental sulfur-based formulations for site-specific sodic soil reclamations. Three products with the help of an industry that we have developed and for low, uh, having uh, soils with low calcium carbonate, 1 to 2 percent calcium carbonate or more than 2 percent calcium carbonate so that we can use these products for the reclamation in the coming times. The other alternates uh, with respect to the gypsum, that is the marine gypsum, fly ash, press mud, municipal solid waste compost, sea waste sludge, and another collaboration that is with the thermal power plants through gypsum that is also initiated. And with this, uh, there is another question of purity of the, the gypsum that is the available in the market and uh, gypsum is not pure and when with these alternates we will certainly be solving this problem also with the purity when we will be getting 90 to 95 percent pure uh, gypsum. The other major technology for uh, saline soils that is subsurface drainage technology that is a Community technology, not a single person, single farmer based technology, around 71,000 hectares we are able to reclaim till now. We are getting uh, higher yields, but in the inland salt affected soils, which are landlocked, it is very difficult to manage because we have to throw the uh, saline water that is to, to be disposed of. That is the major question. But that at CSRI we are doing uh, like we are doing uh, working on the technologies how where we can uh, use this with respect to alkalinity when we talk about sodicity that is when we started reclaiming it was the top 30 centimeter soil but the underneath it is still high pH more than 9.5 pH and the subsoil sodicity, that is the major question that which we are facing as on today is. For that, that is the management of salinity, water logging, subsurface sodicity. There is another machine that is in collaboration with Jirkas, Japan. And uh, we are putting pedestal 
or uh, gypsum underneath and experimenting let's see what we get if we are able to reclaim then subsoil sodicity also then we will be seeing that the resodification that is happening in many parts of the country the resodification will not be happening other that is the major problem is poor quality waters 32 to 84% total saline water underground water that is the farmers they are using for uh, their irrigation purpose saline sodic and saline sodic waters when they are to be used then the productivity again goes low again as we have seen with respect to salt affected soils underground water of the ground water quality that is also deteriorating in the inland as well as in the coastal regions other emerging water quality problems fluoride arsenic etc and when we are to use the poor quality waters that is the saline waters sodic waters or high rsc waters then we have to pass these waters through gypsum bed or pyrite bed this technology that has been developed at csri that is water passage and rsc neutralization efficiency of gypsum beds is improved by mixing gypsum and pressmud in the 4 is to 1 ratio it can neutralize rsc up to 6 ml per liter and then these treated waters we can use for irrigation purpose in the field itself and we can increase our yields the third major technology at csri that is the crop improvement uh, rk singh was talking about diversification but these are the food crops for rice it is around 12 numbers it all started when rk singh was here at this institute till now 12 rice varieties the latest ones csr 56 and csr 60 and for coastal salinity also three varieties they were released in the country the basmati the only fine grain variety basmati csr 30 developed in the india and it is the apida data a third party data around 10377 crores of indian rupees they have been grossed as export earning from 3 years period and this one single variety that covers around 6% of the total area in the country the other major crops where we were working that is wheat and mustard carrot 283 that is the highly uh, salt affected uh, for salt affected soils and cs60 for indian mustard that is for brassica gentia and uh, the pulse for pulses also there is another variety called karnal chanawan for gram chickpea and lentil in collaboration with the indian agriculture research institute the two varieties they have also been released ptl1 and psl1 they are salt tolerant and certainly they can give the farmers better returns other project on potential gene mining from salt tolerant grasses for improvement of salt tolerance and the genes from dicanthium and later in europondra sacculosa they are being transported in the rice and transformed seeds they have been produced and certainly will be getting good uh, rice varieties with these genes to take stock of all the technologies csri has also developed there is another model that is multi enterprise agriculture that is the fish pond type model and uh, we can get all the crops also that is the how a farmer with the limited resources how best he can get his yields when we talk about the microbial mm-hmm. consortia there is csr bio and uh, other uh, hello ezo these are the products which can help us improve the salt tolerance of these alkali soils other technology that is very recently released it is uh, icr fusicon technology that is the first report of panama wilt in the country and uh, with the microbial consortia developed at our regional center in lucknow we are able to restore the productivity of these banana uh, under salt affected soils when we also talk about the conservation agriculture in our experiment around more than 10 years it is the full ca scenario full conservation agriculture 
we are able to record higher yield with lesser irrigation water, lower energy requirement, higher organic carbon, and global warming potential also lower, and above all 20% higher net return. When we talk about the full CA with the maize wheat mung bean, earlier I was talking about rice wheat mung bean, maize wheat mung bean also, we all recorded the higher yield and lower global warming potential and higher net return compared to the farmer's practice. In coastal saline soils also, the conservation agriculture significant effect of crop residue retention in reducing soil salinity in the coastal region that was observed with respect to our regional center at uh, Canning Town. And uh, there is other major problem that is management of waterlogged saline sodic soils. See the level of water on the surface itself. It is all salt wetted soils near a Sharda Sahai Canal area and uh, these are all the salts and we are able to restore the productivity of uh, these soils with land shaping technology or land modification model for waterlogged sodic soils of Sharda Sahai Canal. The farmer gets a pond in the center and on the sides he get all the crops and on the dikes he get all the crops and uh, for the waterlogged sodic soils also as well as the economic soil that has been done. And uh, as well as for the coastal region also, these are the land shaping models. They are farm pond, paddy come fish, deep furrow, high ridge. They have given us very high productivity from these soils. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, able to, because there was limited time and uh, that's why I just rushed through. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the session from the experts. And now we will have the question and Q&A session, but I'm happy to inform you because of the lack of time. People uh, ask the questions and many of the questions were already addressed by the experts on you know, Q&A chat. Few of them are there. Uh, one of them is particularly on that uh, Dr. A.V. Kare Gowdar. Is he, is he from India? Because he's asking where we can get uh, quinoa seeds in our country. And our country, if he's from India, I think they can talk to Dr. P.C. Sharma or maybe the director from NIASM Baramati. Probably they can get the seed. Otherwise, they can contact me. I will start processing there. But in that case, you have to send the import permit. The second question is on that, you know, about the... One, one question from Dr. Dharmesh Verma for Dr. Sharma. Among the amendments, elemental sulfur, sulfur and gypsum for saline alkali treatment, which one has given the better results? So Dr. Sharma can answer that. Pardon? Uh... Among the amendments, elemental sulfur and gypsum for saline alkali soil treatment, which one has the better results? Now the element gypsum has the better results, but the there is a question of purity. But when we have uh, made another products with elemental sulfur, and in that case, we are able to address the problem in a better way. But still, that is not out in the market, and the only product available as on today in the market is gypsum. And then the, certainly in the short span of time, it will come in the market. Arkasing, you are uh, not muted. You are muted. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so one question from Dr. Pushplata. She asked for that. Uh, is this in inland modular farm is available for all the kind of crops? If not, what kind of crop it is suitable? So it is actually we are using. You know, it depends upon the what kind of things you are using because we are using for the brine. So if it is a brine, then we have to grow the halophyte crop for the inland modular farm. So only halophytic crops, which can tolerate a amount of salinity, but you can use utilize that for the low saline crop, but using the conjunctive use. Otherwise, the fresh water, which is coming from the uh, for a desalination plant, you can utilize for any crop. But we can have a email chat on that in case if you want more details on that one. And then another question is from.
uh, we can use halophytes known in the phytocell phyto desalination for the cultivation of glycophytes such as rice you can use but it doesn't give you know, the area which is good which can become good like rice you know for the rice cultivation so it's a, it's okay you can utilize the for the phyto desalination from uh, using the crops which are accumulator the salt accumulator but that doesn't make the area so much desalinized that you can utilize that soil or that land for the rice or other thing but definitely you can utilize less or you know moderately tolerant crop for the, after desalination um, dr mathukia wants to know please give the formula for the salt tolerance index i don't know from whom he talk about i think yeah. uh, dr salt tolerance index dr bando dr rk sir i already provided that i answered that okay okay thank you very much thank you so these are the questions and probably more people can write through the email then we can answer the questions on the email that would be better because the time is you know running out so i will like to i would like to invite dr s k choudhury the ddg nrm icr new delhi and just to introduce him he is his expertise in soil science and agriculture chemistry he is deputy director general of natural resource management indian council of agriculture research new delhi before he this he served as assistant director general of soil science for the soil science in icr he is leading the nrm research in the country and he has many awards and fellowship to his credit so dr choudhury floor is yours thank you so much uh, dr rk singh uh, first uh, right at the beginning i would like to uh, thank igba for joining in this event and uh, making this event very successful and all through participants were more than 300 in numbers and uh, people were taking a lot of interest i was also going through the chats and questions and answers on the screen and interestingly i found that uh, th there is a, a great response from young, pe young people and young scientists uh, in this uh, particular subject it was expected also so uh, my job is to wrap up the whole session we had six presentations uh, in this and uh, I, i was very happy i'm very happy that uh, both uh, director generals were present in the morning for the innovate for innovating the uh, event both uh, isman and uh, dr philoshan mahapatra they put forward the perspective of uh, salinity management globally uh, first presentation from um, our friend and colleague from global soil partnership uh, dr ronald uh, vargas uh, he has correctly mentioned that uh, the, the main drivers of uh, uh, salts and the climate change impact on these drivers and how these drivers are influencing uh, uh, the, the spread of salts in agriculture area uh, this is a major concern globally and the fao as well as all the uh, institutions leading to uh, better agriculture globally they are worried they are, they are worried about uh, this more and more area under uh, uh, salt spread and therefore Uh, need to have better networking, better uh, working collaboration to solve the regional scale problems. The salt affected soils, whether salt affected saline soils or sodic soil, both soils. We in India don't call saline sodic soils, but both both the situation we need to we need to work together at at a regional scale. While working in India or coastal areas of India, we cannot say that uh, we don't want to take uh, the cognizance of the salinity in. bangladesh or salinity in other parts because everything is interrelated if not on surface at least subsurface hydrology is influencing all these things and climate change is making and impacting in a bad way uh, particularly the coastal saline areas the global mapping yet another initiative from the global soil partnership and the role of international network for soil information institutions this was also spoken by ronald which is very important at the end very important hint he has given the fao since i'm the, the focal point of uh, global soil partnership from india i know uh, now there one network is taking shape uh, the international network on salt affected soils so i request all the partners who are present here to go through the, the this network and try to provide better input for that uh, elia our colleague from united states soil sanitary laboratory um, uh, it reminds me my old association with the laboratory and my own base there and my association with uh, reen van genisten 
So uh, he um, explained and uh, brought experiences from his digital agronomy laboratory and especially the regional scale soil salinity assessment uh, using various approaches, but with the apparent electrical conductivity measurement and uh, the, the converting point data into regional scale data, which is a big challenge in uh, soil salinity management and assessment. So he has given very practical uh, hints for coming up with the special variability mapping and special variability um, uh, products using the high resolution remote sensing images and all. So that will be of great use. And this is the modern day techniques and new techniques uh, using which we can uh, come up with the uh, policy decision at the regional scale, not at the farm scale. I'm talking about the regional scale, whether South Asia or whole Asia or whole Asian region or so. Uh, Devendra Sandhu, who's from our uh, Riverside, California, University of California, and both in alfalfa and uh, almond, using the examples of alfalfa and almond, the, the conventional breeding technique and modern breeding techniques, how best we can come up with and the better cultivars and better genotypes for soil salinity management. Our colleague from uh, CSIRO, uh, Canberra, uh, Moinuddin, uh, our own uh, experiment on cropping system intensification or uh, uh, um, our intensification project where CSSRI is also a partner, uh, particularly the, the folder, folder model, which is very, very important for whole coastal region, not only in um, Bangladesh or India, but also other parts of Asia. Uh, other, other parts of Asia. The folder model where subsurface hydrology is unique between two rivers, how this, this salt fronts and the hydrology plays a role and how the salts are managed. Rather than management or rather than removal of salts, better understanding and learning living with the salts is the only option. And what are the alternatives for that? The project has clearly brought out and definitely the lessons learned from this project and CSIRO's leadership, this is going to show a new path, a new, new way forward to coastal agriculture, not only in India and Bangladesh, but other parts of the uh, globe. Dr. R.K. Singh, yet another valued colleague from IGBA. Uh, of course, he always talk of the diversification and he has better experience of uh, the, the plant breeding in uh, um, saline areas. But now, today, he has posed two, three very, very important questions. It is not necessary to grow everything everywhere, number one. Secondly, what are the best possible options for inter and intra crop diversification? And third, if you want to make uh, profitable use of marginal environments, what are the better alternatives and options? Uh, managing sodic soils using gypsum technology or any alternate technology, making them neutral and uh, using, utilizing them for agriculture purposes is a different story. But what Dr. R.K. Singh is talking about, is talking about a story where removal of salts is not that easy. It's not like gypsum technology. It's, and the removal of salt, you require additional things and a lot of investment and community approach. But in that situation, if you go with some better alternatives, which are highly profitable, uh, he has given example of for quinoa. That is the way forward and, and, and we can learn from that and lessons learned from this that will be of great use, particularly the desert parts of India, particularly the, the, the Gujarat parts of India where salinity is very difficult to manage, not only in the, the, the alluvial belt, but also in the, the, the verti soils or, or in insecti soils their salinity management is not that easy. So under that condition, halophytes or salicornia, some of these options and alternatives are there. Quinoa is yet another profitable alternative. And we are really serious and we want to learn uh, a lot of things from Kigba to, to give some alternatives and options for uh, Indian farming community as well as the Asian farming community. At the South Asia level, this type of problems we are facing in so many countries. Bangladesh or even in Sri Lanka, we are facing this problem. So this will be a very good way forward for that. Uh, my colleague from CSSRI, Karnal, Dr. P.C. Sharma, he has also presented before you the Indian experiences, how we started with the uh, with zero from in, in salt affected soils and we have reached to the greenish salt affected soils nowadays and we have uh, technologies for uh, sodic land reclamation, saline land reclamation, waterlogged saline land reclamation, and then we have some um, uh, adaptation techniques in the, in the form of uh, some uh, salt tolerant varieties of different crops and other adaptation techniques in the form of conservation agriculture 
and also some alternative to high, highly degraded lands where forages and uh, some other alternative crops and cropping systems can help us to grow more from the very, very marginal areas. Not only these soils, but he has also quoted some examples of poor quality water, which is a, a very joint problem in the Indian context, in Indian scenario. We cannot talk salt affected soil without referring to poor quality water. And when we are referring to poor quality water, we don't talk only for the saline and sodic water. We are also concerned for the specific iron toxicity in water, whether it's arsenic, boron, chloride, or selenium. So this groundwater uh, contamination because of these uh, uh, non-anthropogenic anthropogenic reasons, uh, this is also becoming a great challenge. So overall, all these speakers, they have made their best efforts to come up with some doable techniques, some alternatives, and they have given uh, so many uh, alternatives for these marginal lands and marginal areas and marginal quality waters. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very much hopeful that we'll be able to draw some recommendations which will lead to regional level policies, number one. Secondly, to the national level policies, number three, some collaborative projects wherein we can learn from each other, and number four, some programs wherein we can give better opportunities to our young students and young minds. So these four, five, six recommendations, if we are able to come up with the, uh, come, come, come out from this uh, one day deliberation or half day deliberation, it will be a great thing. And um, my congratulations to all eminent speakers. We have made excellent presentations and uh, the team CSSRI and team IGBA for jointly organizing this session. I particularly place on record thanks from the ICAR side that we are looking forward for such opportunities to work together. And in future also, I'm very much hopeful that shortly we'll be able to work together and to learn from experiences of each other. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Chaudhary. And indeed, it's a, you're, you're right. The synergy should go together. You know, otherwise, you know, you can't work in the isolation nowadays. It's a globalization era. So we have to work together to take the the best out of it and then come with the more pr propositions and uh, first of all you know this is a very good i will invite dr jad before that i would like to say that in case if we say successful webinar it could be in the terms of the content so contents it was very excellent content from the speakers and the second thing is the participants i saw at one point of time it was 390 participants so you can say that this is already a big achievement on that so with this now i will give the floor to dr hs jart for the vote of thanks so dr hs jart just to introduce him he is a principal scientist in agronomy working on conservation agriculture and climate smart agriculture practices his research focus on sustainable intensification for system sustainability and nation's food security he has also served to the cimit under sustainable intensification program and currently engaged in the how salt dynamics changes with us climate smart agriculture practices in salt affected soils and out scaling of climate smart agricultural practices in the region. Dr. Jat, the floor is yours now. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Singh, and a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who, have, who are joining this webinar. Indeed, it's a great pleasure for me to have a vote of thanks to all who are involved in this webinar. First of all, we are very thankful to our Director General, Indian Council of Agriculture Research and Secretary Department of Agriculture Research and Education, Government of India, Dr. Mahapatra Ji, for giving the words of wisdom to the salinity lovers to boost their confidence. Sir, we are getting the continuous guidance and the support in all the way and also allow us to build the relations with the other salinity organizations for gaining the salt affected soils uh, in the world. We are also thankful uh, to Dr. Isman Ilufi, the Director General, uh, Indian uh, International Center for Biosal and Agriculture, for, for their words and showing the path how best we can use the marginal saline environments or marginal soils. She rightly said that business as usual is no more option and nature has given us opportunity to think out of box in this pandemic COVID-19 situa situations. I'm also thankful to our Deputy Director General, Natural Research Management, Dr. S.K. Chaudhary, for guiding us around the clock for betterment of science in the field of salinity. Dr. Chaudhary's supports always motivate us to do better and better and to achieve the food and nutrition security in the, uh, from the marginal areas of the country. 
Now the thanks are due to all the speakers, Dr. Ronald Ragas, Dr. Ilya Studiero, Dr. Devinder Sandhu, Dr. Mohammad Bainuddin, Dr. R. K. Singh, one of the organizers of this uh, web, international webinar, Dr. P. C. Sharma, the director of the CSSRI and also one of the organizers of this uh, webinar, who covered so nicely about, the, about salt affected soils from A to J. And they have covered from uh, salt affected areas, how we can reclaim, how we can manage the salt affected soils and how best we can use the genotypes available uh, from the salt affected soils and also up to the value chain. And they have showed the path how best we can use these soils, these uh, resources, poor resources. We are also We lost you, Dr. Yat. And also the vice chancellors from the state universities, especially to Dr. Summer Singh from the HAUSAS and others for joining this webinar. And also to all the attendees, without their support, it was not uh, be possible to have this webinars. Uh, thanks to Abdul Mutalib and the IT team for, from both CSSRI as well as the ICBA team. So this is all from my side, Dr. R. K. Singh. Thank you very much, Dr. Jad. So just in the last, I would like to also uh, introduce Dr. Mr. Mutalib, who is the head of our communication team, knowledge management and communication team, and he is in the background of all the organization from ICWA side. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Good, uh, first of all, good day, and thank you very much. It was a, a very great uh, webinar. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. So I hope uh, so did uh, the attendees and, uh, and the speakers. Thank you. So thank, thank, thank you. Very thank, much. thank you so much. And uh, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank Very you. Hearty, hearty congratulations to each of you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Nice to join with you. Lot and, of uh, thanks to those people who are working, who are working uh, even the night. I think I can see the Elia, and the, the, it must be near to the midnight. So thank you very much. And also Dr. Devinder Sandhu, they are, they are also almost in the midnight. You know. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thanks to ICR and CSSRI to involve ECWA for this very well organized webinar. And thanks to Dr. P.C. Sharma, who was you know, instrumental in that. And also in the background, Dr. Chaudhary, who, who is also you know, the, the, like backstopping everything. Thank you very much. And also thanks to our two different, the big patrons. Without them, it cannot be possible. Dr. Mahapatra and Dr. Sman. Thank you very much to all the participants and also the listeners, because without them, also this webinar has no value. Yeah. Thank you, RK, from my side also, to Iqba, to Dr. Manudin, Dr. Elia, Dr. Devendra Sandhu, Dr. Vargas, Tonar, and uh, all the participants. Dr. Patra is there. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank Dr. Sharma, very nice. Yes, it was really learning. A lot of good things, new things we came to know. Very nice. Thank you, Thank each you. of you. Thank Arty you. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.